Hello and welcome to another Office 365 Hours. My name is Christian Buckley. I'm the Microsoft Go-To-Market Director here at AvPoint and a Microsoft MVP and Regional Director. And I'm joined today by Sue Hanley, a fellow Office Apps and Services MVP and an independent consultant with Susan Hanley LLC. Hello, <laughs> Sue, good morning. Hi, good morning. It's great to see you. And I see that you've got the Viva background ready. Oh, yeah. You're ready to di jump in, to dig in. Yes, I am in the Viva lounge. Multiple people actually. Uh, I think it may be depending on what I'm wearing on a given day when, when you know the tech for the background works better have said to me, oh wow, what a great office you have. I'm like, <laughs> oh wow, it is so right. fake. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sue, why don't you give a little more of a background, kind of your, your history in the, in the space and within the community? Um, so I'm, as you said, an independent consultant. I've been focused on designing and building intranets uh, probably for most of the last 17 years, which is um, how long I've had my own company. But I come out of, uh, in the software space, I come from a knowledge management background prior to this world uh, that I'm in right now. I was the director of knowledge management for a global consultancy, and then I um, led the uh, portals and collaboration practice for a little company called Dell, and then hung out a shingle about seven, almost 17 years ago, and have been basically all in on SharePoint and Microsoft 365 ever since. So I approached the world from the perspective of an information architect business analyst and basically focused on the people side of deploying software, which I've been doing for. You know, well, that's where, years. and we've connected. I know that, uh, you know, so we've known each other for more than a decade and we got uh, uh, to know each other through the various, came up through the SharePoint ranks, I guess the best way to describe that. And SharePoint Saturdays, various events out there. And I too, you know, uh, often discuss with my project management background, always discuss the people and process part of you know, the approach to these technical topics. And uh, so very much akin. I look at like a core group of people. If folks that, uh, you know, go and do some research on Sue Hanley, but there's a number of other people out there like Reuven Gotts and Paul Colmsey and, you know, and others that, that really focused on information architecture and the life cycle management around like the process of going and delivering technical projects and and the, the heavy preparation planning that goes into those efforts, not just, hey, let's now review code and here's how you build this widget and that that kind of thing. Nothing wrong with that kind of content out there. There's a need for, for both of that, both of those. But let's jump in on the topic today. So the role of information architecture in Microsoft Viva. I know this is still very new, and so there's a lot of things that we don't know and what this could evolve and, and become over time. But I, I do believe that there are some things that we very much know based mm -hmm. on where the four Viva products are, are you know, kind of fit within the organization, what Microsoft is doing. So let's let's start off with uh, question number one here. Let's talk about like the the importance of information architecture, like what it is at a high level. Uh, it's it's not new, and yet companies still struggle with it. And I know our. our combining experiences with SharePoint and building intranets, building portals and knowledge management systems in general, and companies struggle with building and maintaining, really maintaining the information architecture. So what are the gaps that you see with customers still? So, you know, I think, I don't know if I'd call it a gap, but let's call it an opportunity that Viva creates. If you've been doing this right all along, and believe me, there are plenty of organizations that are very, very successful. I judge one of the digital workplace uh, competitions like in intranet beauty pageant, and I can tell you that there are a lot of phenomenal solutions that I've gotten to look at over the last uh, seven years. So there's a lot of great work going on, and I'll tell you the pattern in these award-winning organizations is that they have always approached the concept of um, intranet and digital workplace from, from a, biz, a holistic business value perspective. And in order to do that, you they, they have always used the language that Microsoft Viva has introduced, focused on employee experience. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the opportunities that Viva creates, if you haven't already sort of developed a holistic view of the solutions that you're delivering to drive value in the organization, whether they're knowledge management or intranet or digital workplace or all of the above, is 
creating that holistic view of the world. It's not just IT. It is not just comms and is not just HR. We need to, or just knowledge management. You really need to think about holistic employee experiences. And I think a lot of architecting that solution or be enabling that solution is thinking about information architecture. But you know, the bigger value prop to me for Viva is um, encouraging that conversation. So coming at the approach of how we deliver services to our employees from their view of the world, this whole um, the employee experience perspective, and not just having an HR portal and a comms portal and inter- whatever, but thinking about the entire um, employee experience holistically. And so to me, that that is a huge gap in organizations that are having struggles today. And you know, just introducing that vocabulary I think is probably the biggest benefit of the Viva conversation. Even if you're not going to deploy any of the modules, um, it's the vocabulary introduction and thinking about employees holistically, you know, the employee experience holistically that I think we are is the biggest benefit to the marketplace now and the biggest uh, challenge to. When you talk about looking at it, viewing it holistically, I mean, the first thing I think of, like my, my experience in the late 90s, I spent some time as a product manager Uh, into 2000, joined a new startup and owned the development of, uh, funny enough, a hosted collaboration platform that was not on the Microsoft stack. Uh, But building that out, and I was constantly looking at not just the features we were trying to build, the the technical problems we were trying to solve at this stage, which was the primary goal of what we were building, but Mm -hmm. looking at it end to end, what are the, our customers really trying to do across that life cycle and we in, were involved here and here and what but what is that entire experience like and that very much changed the way that we built our solution right i mean i think so also it's how you have to think about this is the work that i often do when i'm um, helping organizations architect internets as you start with for whom are we creating this solution content experience who are our users what do they need to know you know, what are their hopes, dreams, and desires? Um, what techno- What terminology are they familiar with? What makes sense to them? What jargon will they relate to? What language and vocabulary should we never ever use? So if I'm in the HR department, I know we all know what an SPD is, a summary plan description, but no human outside of HR has ever referred to their benefit description as an SPD. So no, I'm not gonna tag my content with I am an SPD because no regular person will find it that way. And so again, it's a matter of focusing on the outcomes that we are trying to achieve. And I know you've heard me say this a million times, I do not use the R word requirements. I wanna focus on the business outcomes that I'm trying to achieve and for whom I am trying to achieve them. Let me just point out that you said it just now, but uh, I'll I'll let that one- Yes, I know. (laughs) <laughs> you have to explain what the R word is all about. But anyways, I think all, you know, again, that's really what the employee experience focus is really allowing us to do is approach the problem with the end uh, person involved who is, and, and think about what they need to do, what do they need to learn, and how do they get work done. And what we are trying to do is create experiences that improve their lives, not add additional burden. And so that really means we need to understand what are your problems. Um, and, and, you know, being very practical about that when you're having conversations to develop an information architecture is who are we building this for and what do they need to know? Not just what you want to tell them, but what is it that they need to accomplish? You know, thinking about your solutions that way can really be a game changer for content providers. Sort of, but oh, just never thought about it that way. I'm, you know, constantly thinking about what do I need to tell you? What do I need to tell you? What do I know? I mean, what do you need to learn? What might you be doing? And what scenarios? And, you know, in what type of scenarios are you trying to engage me? Why don't I make that super easy to find? Yeah, I think uh, one of the, the like a quick acid test for success on whether you've planned and built that out correctly is uh, adoption and uh, engagement on the platform uh, post. And a lot of organizations that get confused, like we're still not seeing numbers around there. Do you really have to be, you know, inwardly looking at it's like, how do we go through that process? Did we really look at how our people were working in the first place and developing a solution that 
Uh, you know, not not that you just build something based on the way people work today entirely, but that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, and then you you lead them towards the path of how to optimize that and improve upon that. Um, but yeah, but how we measure adoption also we have to look at that too. Time on you know time on the platform could be a negative because right? you're not finding what you're looking for. Again, we should be measuring adoption and are we changing? You know, are we accomplishing processes quicker? In other words, what business value are we delivering? Not just are we getting eyeballs on news. It isn't that I looked at the news. Is that I take the action that the news wanted me to take. That actually may mean architecting the way you write. I mean, information architecture is a pretty big topic, and I focus it from on it from the all the way from the big navigation and site structure perspective, but down to how you create content, how you write. Um, content for your news posts will help drive whether the action that you want people to take actually happens. And so just look, you know, how you measure adoption should be how we move the needle in the organization, not just did I get eyeballs on pages and did I write 100 right. articles. Well, they don't that, do that's always the hard part is that it's easy to go in there and capture the qualitative measurements or the, the quantitative measurements, right. but the System qualitative methods. measurements, right. uh, it, it's it's as much art as it is science of what you go in and do, but. And not, and not so much, because here's the thing, you're probably already measuring those things because every organization has business value KPIs. We should be committing to addressing those. So this is why when you think about this holistic experience, you really need to understand what are the big rocks for our organization, what are we focused on? And everything we do, every KM initiative, every internet page and content area that we create should be focused on addressing those business goals because we're already measuring them. And if we can impact them, then we know we're delivering value. And on an ongoing basis, that's what gets us more funding to do more and better things. Well, in many ways, that's exactly what Viva is attempting to do, too. It's, it's looking at its next level. We have our basic, we can store documents, we can track them, we can move it in, we've got all the security, we've got all the rest of that out there. But now it's like we're looking at how people are actually working. And is that the best way to work? Is it the healthiest way? Are, are people happy within that? What are the best ways for us to go in and, and measure, again, that, that more holistic view of what our customers are doing the platform? And that was some of the initial pitch of, of Viva. So, so now that organizations are starting to look into Viva and investigate, it's, again, it's brand new, but so what are some of the information architecture implications of, uh, of Viva specifically? So, you know, when I come at the world, I mean, I'm primarily focused in the world of Viva connections, and I spend a lot of time, obviously, in organizations that are deploying Viva topics. But when I think about um, sort of information architecture things that are really different. And again, uh, Viva didn't introduce this, but Viva is leveraging this, is what you really now need to think about are audiences. Because the one really huge thing that really makes, you know, separates the good internets from the great ones is the ability to target information to the right people, to get it to them in the right place at the right time, in the right format. Which is always the promise of, uh, uh, of, of SharePoint course. and kind of, you know, well, all of the knowledge things. management, right? right? No. Information, right, right time, right people, right format. Okay. But what we really, really, really need to focus on now, and it's a governance and an IA decision, which as you already know, but I'll just say for our audience, they go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. Um, so what you want to think about from an architecture perspective is what are those key audiences and in our internet world, we often start with thinking about personas, and that may be a good way to start identifying your audiences. But you need to figure out who are the primary, uh, who, who are those audiences of people to whom we need to target information? And then on the technical side, do we have an existing entity that works in the Microsoft 365 target audience capability, which basically means an Azure AD group? Do we have an existing Azure AD group that we can use to um, uh, create that, to target that experience, that app in Viva Connections, that news post, that page, that whatever. So audiences are really the key architectural, one of the key architectural elements that Viva is highlighting and asking us to now really think through. Too many, and you're never gonna be able to manage your world because you have to keep these audiences in sync but you also have to educate content producers on what are the available audiences. And if they get too fine-grained, no one is gonna remember 
who's in what. And so you're going to have to label them crystal clear and you're going to have to really know what they are. So you're not going to have thousands of audiences. You need a manageable number that you can both maintain and communicate the benefit and value of using them and teach people how to use them effectively. And if there's one thing that Viva has really introduced or extended, I guess, because we really should have been thinking about this earlier, is to get the best value from uh, the Viva elements, you need to start thinking about how can I target content. And so that, I think, from a structural perspective um, or an architectural perspective, planning and implementing and educating people about target audiences is a, it, it's something we need to put our heads down on. Is there anything else that uh, that you know, kind of stands out? So I know with like specifically around topics, as a lot of a lot of conversations around uh, topics and the work that, uh, that that needs to be done up front. I know you were involved with and are familiar with some of the companies that were part of like the initial beta testing of this, and and it, I've interviewed two companies. Uh, people within two companies that were part of that first wave, mm -hmm. and both of their their feedback was, uh, you know, they were still fairly tight lipped about things at that time, uh, but said that um, you know we need to do a better job at just sitting and thinking about uh, the information architecture and what that meant for the two different organizations was slightly different things, but there's, they, they talked about audiences, they talked about doing a content inventory and really understanding what's out there and remapping things. It was a huge effort. We were talking about a company with 40, 50,000 employees, tends to be a lot of content. So that's a large effort to go in and do that content inventory. But other things that you see organizations that, are, that they're doing, so, you know, the interesting thing when you deploy um, topics in a very large organization, the AI over time is going to build you an enormous collection of prospective topics. And the, and the nice thing is it gives you some guidance about sort of the, let's call it the weight of each topic so you can kind of filter and sort. Uh, the challenge is that AI uh, doesn't work very well without IA and without people. And so you really need to combine the whole thing. And right now, I think people are probably the most important part of the equation. So the AI, the generated topic is going to give you a really good head start on sort of what is pervasive in the mm -hmm. content that you have. But you're going to need to do some curating. And it if you get 20,000 topics generated for you, which is what's going to happen in a large yeah. organization, you cannot go focus on 20,000 topics. So you're going to have to prioritize sort of what's important. And you're going to need some human expertise to uh, filter out the suggested content that actually has nothing to do with the topic. The person may have, you know, written about it one time, but they still right. don't know anything about it. And well, so that, you know, takes some effort. Well, there, there's two things that I, that I, uh, kind of my, my observations. And I, I said early on, I said, I look, I, but before we knew what it looked like and how it was going to be architected, I, I kept saying that I want to understand fully what the, the governance around all of this is. What is the curation process, yeah. the management effort to, to clean up? Because I, and part of my that response came from my other comment, which is, do you remember when Delve was released? <laughs> yes. And no matter how much Microsoft said in advance, like, look, it has to learn. It has to, you have to use it and it will get better and improve over time. And they kind of said the same thing around uh, topics. They said, you, you got to go into this knowing that it's going to go in and do a certain number of things, but then you have to clean up and you have to do the information architecture, which will uncover other opportunities to go in and, and reorganize and shuffle things some more. And as it, as it improves, it gets smarter about the things that it identifies and moves in, but it's an active process between uh, AI uh, uh, the 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 curation process and feedback from users. And so that's really what the challenge is, because if you deploy to a wide swath of people in the organization, the uh, the jarring UI, like, whoa, what is this all about? And and the potential intolerance for inaccuracy is the risk. So if you, but if you deploy too small, um, you know, if the it's almost like a little three bear scenario. You have to find the exact right mix. If you deploy it too small, you're asking a small number of people to curate content they may not be aware of 
sort of the best way to curate it. So it works better if more people are curating, but you do have to understand the subject matter. And so I think it is very hard to bring someone into the, like you can't just hire someone to curate topics for you. It's not a summer intern job because they won't know enough about the organization. And in order to learn enough, be a great way for them to learn, but they'd have to do a whole lot of homework and they won't get a lot done. So it, you, it really figuring out how to tune the AI is an investment and a commitment. But in an organization that is large, where there is this potential, an incredible potential value from being able to do what humans cannot do, which is pull all of this information and make all these connections that might not be so obvious, pulling all that together, it, it, you have to realize that if you will take the time, uh, the AI gets better, the content gets better because you are combining human, human curation with artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of that kind of stuff, that, that everything will get better um, and improve, but the potential value to someone coming into the organization or people sort of starting to experience it, the, um, you know, what it means to see a topic card and show you all that relevant information in the context of where you're working, it is huge. And from a KM perspective, we were dreaming about this 25 years ago. This right. kind of experience is exactly what we wanted at a point where we didn't have the technology. And quite honestly, we may have had the algorithms, but they were too expensive to right. implement at scale. So now that we have this, we have to, A, stop thinking that the AI is going to do it without us. We are still important, and that's a good thing. Yes, if your content was architected very well prior to this, it, the AI would be smarter. I mean, I 100% agree with that. But again, I, you know, is this a chicken or an egg? You can't necessarily expect everyone to re-architect all their content when right. there's so many things that we're focused on. Yeah, should it have been architected well to begin with? A hundred thousand trillion percent. But well, you know, we are uh, where we are. So. Well, that's what, you know, organizations that have very structured content, they have intake forms, it's organized, that they build those templates out, like they're going to be able to take advantage of a lot of this, like very quickly to help, you know, in, in theory, but optimize around. Yeah, although I wonder, templates. like organizations that have a lot of highly structured content will benefit from SharePoint syntax, but I think less from Viva Topics, which is really mm -hmm. designed to take the unstructured content and bring that knowledge and value together in a single place. So yes, if your content is highly structured, you will get an enormous benefit from the auto tagging, if you will, properties that you can get from, again, that the same, you know, sort of Project Cortex background. But Viva Topics has, I think, a different outcome goal. And it is, it, it is best on this. It, it allows you to get some value from your unstructured content, which honestly, to me, it's the unstructured content where all the real knowledge and expertise lives. And so being able to make sense out of unstructured content is taking the, you know, the, is really where the whole, uh, the holy grail of knowledge management comes into play. And so honestly, it's the most exciting part, but it is also the most evolving part. And to just think you can plop it in your organization and bingo, um, every, all the knowledge of the world will be driven on every single page and everyone will be happy and angels will be singing and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So, Well, if that happens to an organization out there, so not saying that that can't happen, that mir miraculous uh, start to this, um, but call Sue and I, and we'll show <laughs> up with a video camera and interview. I would love <laughs> to see. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I guess what I'm saying is if your IA was perfect, and I understand the feedback that you're getting from people, if your IA was absolutely outstanding and every single piece of content was tagged and all that, would Viva Topics deploy itself more effectively? Parts of it, yes. But here's where would you'd still fall apart. You'd fall apart on the people part, potentially, because um, you still want to identify who knows about something. And so you'd then also have to say, well, was the expert on every topic contributing that content so that they were associated as authoring the content on that topic? I still don't think it would be perfect. Yes, it would be better, but I'm not sure that sort of giving yourselves the saying, okay, we can't deploy it until we perfect our RA, our IA, that makes no sense at all to me. Right. I think if you deploy it, it will help you perfect your IA. So I, I would argue if there is business value in your industry, company, or organization, 
don't wait to clean something up before you start trying to. Well, I, I think that's the thing. The mistake is thinking that you can have a perfect IA before you go and deploy right. because perfection comes through iteration and learning over time. Right. And, and if the good news is that um, Mark Cashman wrote a great article, a uh, blog post a few, um, maybe it was more than a month ago. I, I have no concept of time anymore <laughs> since I don't leave my house, but um, about, you know, you're never done. An intranet is never done. And none of this, you know, all of these knowledge management solutions are never done. And so if you have this sort of set it and forget it mindset, you're going to fail in so many different ways. And so you need to be actively engaging. And as you're right, everything about your information architecture has to be reviewed on an ongoing basis. Other, otherwise, you are um, destined to fail. Change is part of what you're committing to. Well, just in the last minute that we have or so, um, you know, for, for organizations that are that are starting to think about Viva, you know, where do they go? Where, where do you point them generally to go and to to start preparing? So I know you can go to the Microsoft Viva sites and they've got the nice marketing material and things that are out there. What's kind of your go to location where you point people? Is it to that site or is there are there other resources that you recommend? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, yes, I am sending people to that site. I am, I am not seeing as of yet anyone saying I'm going for all four modules. So I'm going to be all in on Viva. And so just like anything, you have to bite off what you can bite off. So, um, I think we are now, um, in the conference season that is, you know, sort of has started in March and is continuing to evolve you will start to see more practical conversations about how we did it uh, in conferences. And I think that will be your best in the moment. And as always, sort of blogs and things like that. I mean, again, it's very early in the process for most of this. And so I don't know that there's a go-to place that I would send people to. Um, at, you know, for me, like if we just focus on the Viva Connections part of the world, about the only thing you can do with that right now is bring your intranet nav into Teams, which is, and your intranet experience into Teams. Huge, wonderful, I totally love it. Um, uh, but it does mean that you need to have a great modern intranet. You need to have deployed global navigation. You need to have a home site. So let's get, like, get that part of your house in order. And as part of that, start thinking about the concept of targeting. Who are your primary users? And your user communities, how are you going to get audiences to match them? Because the biggest benefit when you deploy it into Teams, again, even not even pre Viva Connections is targeting with um, the soon to be released sort of apps for Viva Connections. You're going to want to target the right app to the right person. How is how do you do that? It's all dependent on audiences. So I think focusing there as you're thinking about your the Viva Connections deployment audiences and navigation are probably where I would put, you know, wrap some energy right now. If you are already modern, if you're not modern, get there. Right. right? Yep. Um, and I, again, for Viva topics, although we can't do it today, having um, sort of enterprise data in the managed metadata service or having your sort of key topics, key organizational entities that is going to drive, that will help the AI build better topics for you. And so that's another element on your um, SharePoint platform that can actually help when you're deploying Viva topics as well. So yeah, great IA solves the problem. <laughs> it's good for everything. Everyone needs it. But I guess I would sort of you know focus on the module that you are um, that is driving you know resonating value or resonating with your users. And at least on the internet side, those are the kind of things I'd start doing. Well, Sue, thanks so much for your time and for sharing some of your experiences here. And uh, for those that want to get in touch with you, so Sue, of course, is out on on the Twitters and mm -hmm. out on LinkedIn. You can find her there. And uh, so you look up uh, Susan Hanley LLC and hire her for uh, for to come help your organization with us. She has no time for anybody else. No, oh, that's not true. She's so busy. But uh, <laughs> well, I but, try uh, to make time to have conversations, which is really great. And um, yeah, I mean, everybody's schedule changes all the time. So I, yes, I'm busy. I'm very happy to be busy, but um, I love 
working with clients and I love learning. And that's why I love being a consultant. And I've done this my entire career because it's a great way to learn and share what you know. And I learn from people that are that ask me questions. So I'm super happy. That's really what I like to do. That's why I love to speak at conferences because people ask me about things which force me to think about them and then try to come up with solutions. I love getting those questions where it's like, especially at the end of a presentation where they say, really like the presentation, but I had this question and I'm just like, I don't know. I need to go and dig in and 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 learn that and find that out. I, I love those responses. Yeah. Of course, those people were you know looking for the answer in your presentation, but you better believe it'll be in the next time that I give that presentation. So absolutely yeah. true. So just one other thing is that although I go by Sue everywhere um out there in the interwebs, I am Susan Hamley. So just look but when that. you see her in person, do not call her Susan. It's Unless you're gonna yell at me. <laughs> And okay. then you have to throw the middle name in there too, because <laughs> I will go back to my childhood at That's that right. point, but I answer to it. Well, thanks so much, Sue, for your time. And thanks everybody for watching this Office 365 Hours. We will be back again. We're on every first and third Wednesday of the month at 8 a.m. Pacific. And so join us next month. We'll have another guest, another topic, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody there. Thanks a lot.